This week, we welcome writer and commentator Stephen L. Miller. I always wanted to be something other than, you know, conservative media. And I always say that I don't read a ton of conservative media because I know what they already think and I know what they say. And uh, I always encourage other people to read different views, whether it could be liberal or whatever. And I think that that's how you and I stumbled on each other's radars because I think you were writing for Playboy at the time. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I just saw you come across my feed with just kind of these weird, sensible kind of counterculture takes. And I was like, she's interesting. You were off of the map of you know, the, the cliche of circles that you see on Twitter amongst peer and political groups. And those are the kind of the people I try to seek out. And with people like Zed Jelani, who is on I the opposite them. end of the spectrum. And yeah. uh, it's, it's Glenn Greenwald. And it's, yeah. you know, it's not this kind of default, you know, political hierarchy or a tribe. This is Walkins. Welcome with Bridget Fettesy. I'm Bridget Fettesy, and you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback and we want to hear from you. If you like our work and want to support us, the best way to do that is join Phetasy.com. You'll get access to behind the scenes content, outtakes, discounts on merch, and the ability to submit questions for some of our upcoming guests. Support your favorite scrappy little internet heroes at Phetasy.com. I'm with Stephen Miller, everybody. Welcome to Walk-Ins. Welcome. Overdue. Yeah, I'd say. You've been doing this a couple of years. And, yeah, we've been doing this uh, a while. I, every week, I'm kind of like... Where's my invite? What the fuck? <laughs> Can we curse <laughs> on this? Yeah, of course. Or, of, oh, okay. Of course. I was going to say, you you're going to bleep me there. kicked off. No, it's fine. <laughs> um, we, for considering that you're my husband's number one choice for the Twitter debate team. This is wow. very overdue. <laughs> wow. Yeah, he's like Stephen Miller, top pick. He comes with receipts. Yeah, get, get that guy. Like, did, did you ever have weird conversations with him? Was he ever like, when are you going to get Stephen Miller on the podcast? <laughs> Fuck. He, he was Stop very. asking me. <laughs> he did say it. He, I think you are his favorite Twitter follow um, because you just call out everybody for their hypocrisy but not only that you bring receipts which i don't know do you just have a folder it's just all like probably uh, on the spectrum brain full of junk where you just remember things you, and it's uh, it's also easy like when you know someone is doing a double standard more times than not you can just guess and you just search word on twitter and you go Right. I mean, the first five results, most of it's memory. I just, mm. I have a knack for remembering useless knowledge. Yeah, I know. I think I was joking to you in the DMs once that so you're like the rain man of <laughs> Twitter. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know what it is. It's, I, I've been that way a lot with music and movies my whole life. So, mm. I mean, I was a great, I was a great teenage blockbuster employee because I was the kid that everyone would come in and be like, you know, that movie with the guy and the, they're driving a car and within like three, you know, it's like, oh yeah, you're, you're looking for that one over there. And I think that just translated over to the internet so easy because we have such short attention spans now where, you know, through internet forums and Reddit and things like that to social media to where now everything is just, you know, just doom scrolling constantly and just trying to pick up on things. Yeah, people can really get away with a lot of shamelessness in this day and age because there's no there's no memory other than you who might be the internet's memory. But it yeah. is, it does, you do have that. I was just writing about this, how when I was a teenager, I had, I always wanted to be one of those people that had that memory for music where you could be like, oh, you know, that album, it came out in 1992 and it featured blah, blah, blah. And they did two tracks that I, I always wanted to be that cool. And I just that, never that was. That was Jesus and Mary, you just named Jesus and Mary Chain, by the way. <laughs> That's so too, too how did that. you stumble into this? What do, what do you consider? We were kind of talking about this before we started, but what do you consider yeah. yourself? Oh, I mean, I, I quite literally stumbled into it. So mm -hmm. uh, Me too. I, I mean, uh, I moved kind of, I moved to New York City, I think in 2010, 2011. And that was right when Occupy Wall Street was happening. And I, I was staying in an apartment right down the road from 
from Zuccotti Park. And so I kind of ventured down over there and uh, I've been kind of in journalism and media hypocrisy kind of my whole life. But when you see, especially like on Twitter at that time, you see how Occupy Wall Street's being portrayed, especially in our media. And then you actually go down there and I shit you not, it's like Mad Max Fury Road. Okay. (laughs) You, that gives you kind of an urge to, you know, say here, this is what's happening. Here's what I'm seeing, whatever. And, you know, Twitter as a medium in the beginning is very democratic. You can kind of, you know, elbow your way into the conversation if if you're pithy and if you're smart. And I, and I think if you're not too abusive and whatever, if you have something to say, you can, you know, like I said, you can kind of jump in. You can jump into the mosh pit a bit mm-hmm. and hold your own. Totally. And that's kind of just what happened. Um, I just started following the right people. You start to pay attention to not only national media, you know, clouds of nothingness, you start to learn about the individual journalists and people behind stories. And that's not necessarily the left or mainstream. It's also on the political right. It. I also think you have to have a uh, – an, an unbreakable bullshit detector. And that goes from, you know, from pundits on the left that you might disagree with to pundits on the right, who you can look at and say, I know why you're doing this. You don't really care. Um, and so I think where I really, I started to take off a little bit and I kind of, I think I started setting goals where I was like, all right, if I get to 10,000 Twitter followers, I'll start a website because people mm. actually might be interested in what I'm saying. And that's kind of what happened. And I think, I think my first real, exposure was uh the the nights the two three nights of benghazi and that's where michelle malkin's twitchy kind of picked me up and that from pretty much then on it was just kind of like i have i guess i have to keep doing this um (laughs) (laughs) and then uh when i started the wilderness which was kind of a uh it was kind of a a counterculture right-leaning blog i didn't want it to look like conservative websites because conservative websites drive me crazy in their design and their presentation. And I think that has, and it hurts a lot of arguments. People don't want to believe that, but I come from a design background. I come from an interactive design background. So I would be looking at websites like Mother Jones, for example, and they have these gorgeous splash pages, these incredible graphics, and it it just sucks you into what they're saying, even if what they're saying is incredibly dishonest. Mm -hmm. And so when I set out to do the wilderness, that's kind of what it was. I wanted to do kind of like long form weekly posts. And then I got picked up by National Review. And uh, it's interesting because a post that put me on the map for National Review was uh, I did a I did a post called the front runner where I declared Joe Biden the 2016 front runner. And I did all of these kooky where he's sniffing a bald eagle. And then, (laughs) I, you know, you remember those uh, those gumball machine stickers with the silver around them and stuff. So I did I did his name and that kind of logoing Uh jets and, and nuclear explosions. It was all about kind of how. Uh, Biden's just America's walking meme at the time. This is just a dude where it's he's ungaffable. He, you know, the press looked at him as being lovable every time he tells a dude in a wheelchair to stand up. And there's nothing wrong with grabbing uh, President Ash Carter's wife's hair and sniffing it right yeah. in front of a camera. And they didn't see anything wrong with that. They're just kind of like, oh, he did that. Okay. <laughs> And so that kind of put me on the map of National Review. And pretty much from then on, it's kind of like, well, I, I I can't really do much else with my life now. So it's not like I can probably go work at some firm or something because I have an internet footprint now that is yeah. 11 years long. And, you know, when you type it in, the first four things come up about crashing a Wonder Woman screening. And so it's kind of like I'm I'm pretty much stuck in this until I decide to just retire to an island and be a shepherd, which might happen if Trump, <laughs> if, if, if Trump wins again. That might be it. I might be just like, peace out. Yeah, I'm done. I'm done. You know, I, I always look, I, I always wanted to be something other than, you know, conservative media. And I always say that I don't read a ton of conservative media because I know what they already think and I know what they say. And uh, I always encourage other people to read different views, whether it could be liberal or whatever. And I think that that's how you and I stumbled on each other's radars, because I think you were writing for Playboy at the time. Mm-hmm. And I, I I just saw you come across my feed with just kind of these weird, sensible kind of counterculture takes. And I was like, she's interesting. And, uh, and I think that that's how kind of you stumbled into this, too, is you kind of got a little bit of a following. And then now here you are doing this. And... Um, but that's what I always I liked about you. You were off of the map of, you know, the, the cliche of circles that you see on Twitter amongst 
peer and political groups. And those are the kind of the people I try to seek out. And if you look at a lot of my interactions these days, it's it's with people like Zed Jelani, who is on I the opposite them. end of the spectrum. And yeah. uh, it's, it's Glenn Greenwald. And it's, yeah. you know, it's not this kind of default, you know, political hierarchy or a tribe. Yeah. And so um, I'm definitely still of the right, um, probably the believe in nothing right. But um, again, I already know what those people believe. And so I'm always kind of searching for these next kind of misfits to to either latch on to or kind of say, I'm going to go over there with those guys. Yeah, it's there's so much there. I, my first question is, were you raised conservative? Is that your background? Uh, my dad was a huge Rush Limbaugh head, okay. so there's probably there's probably some indoctrination, you know, indoctrination happening there. Yeah, um, you know, listening, you know, he was the he was the Rush Limbaugh guy, but he never like pounded it into me. He was never like listen to what he's saying, son. You know, and slap me upside the head or whatever. Um, I, I think I just I looked at, you know, some, and I was a kid of the '90s, so I came up through in the Bill Clinton era, and that was one of my first kind of exposures with media was. Um, the, the way that they protected a president from a 21 year old intern and were literally like out destroying this person's life. That was nuts. And, how and how old even, are you? It's even, uh, I'm 40. Okay. So yeah, we're, so, I'm 44. Yeah, we're around yeah. the same. I remember that so well. I was like, yeah. what about her? That was yeah, so. And, and it was, and it, you know, what's even crazier is like the attitude today where she is, considered, you know, a me the media loves her. She's a media darling. And she's still, you know, every time she tweets about something, it's, oh, Monica, yeah, get her. And it's, and it's kind of like, were you, we were around in the 90s. We saw how you <laughs> treated her. Like, what is this? And that was kind of one of my first things about media power. And, you know, I've, I've had my own personal experiences. I've, I was a journalism student in early high school, and I became very, very jaded with that just based on the teachers and the authority there. Um, and I've just, I've had my own media run-ins where I'm kind of like, uh, I, I don't always think the political right is correct. Okay. I don't think that they're always, they always have the right ideas or whatever, but when you see an entire industry complex stacked against certain points of views, I kind of look at it and say, okay, why are they doing this? And that's kind of why I've always been that way. So to say I was like raised conservative, eh, you know, yes and no. My my mother was not particularly political, and my brother is now. My brother's gone from being raised in the same household to becoming a flaming liberal who went to CU Boulder to now because of what happened with COVID and he had two teenagers. Now is kind of shifting more to the libertarian left, <laughs> and so it's it's really funny to kind of watch him start to come around because he. He, he was one of these guys who was like Al Frank and pounding the table, John Stewart guys. And he basically just, I can't talk about politics anymore and whatever. And so I, I wouldn't say that uh, I was raised conservative, um, but I was definitely like pointed in certain directions where you can say, hey, yeah, why why is that like this? Or, or why are they doing this? And um, you know, I, I guess that's just how I came about that way. And I mean, it's and it's easy if you're. I mean, if you stay principled on certain things, it's pretty. You know, it's pretty easy to you know say that that it's like no, I wasn't I wasn't raised in conservative household. I wasn't you know whipped with a crucifix or anything like that. <laughs> um, but yeah, my, my dad was typical Trump voting uh, Rush Limbaugh boomer. Still is. Yeah. He's not Trump voting anymore. He's a DeSantis guy now, but that's who he is. Interesting. I think all the boomers are DeSantis guys, even even the liberals. <laughs> even, even Trump, technically, <laughs> like when you get right down there. <laughs> Trump might be. He might end up being a DeSantis guy. We'll I see. have a few family um, members who surprised me by saying that they would, and these are dyed-in-the-wool liberals who said that yeah. they, if it came down to Biden and DeSantis, they would vote DeSantis. Yeah, I, I was like and all the, shocked and, to and hear all, that. And all the old people moved to Florida too, so there is that. Yeah, yeah. I think even it's, the New Yorkers. I think like, it's honestly like the gender stuff. Really, just these boomers don't get it at all, and they've had these conversations. I don't, I don't get it. Look, I don't get it, <laughs> and I spend every this fucking like, day of my life talking about this shit, this is, and it makes this is me like want to first. This is like the first issue where just being Gen X and being one of those people where it's kind of like, I, I think, I think it's passed me by. It's like, I think this, I think the cultures that and kind of AI and the Neuralink stuff. And now the meta with the goggles, I'm like, I will not wear the goggles. I'm not putting on the goggles. I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, the, the, the pronoun stuff is I think the first time. And then now we're into this huge, this, this rampant gender debate. 
And what's interesting about that is I, there's this distinct thing of what you think is political on Twitter, what you think is political online, and then what you see in the everyday life. And I have never run into someone who said, these are my pronouns, like not once. And I, and most of my friends are pretty liberal or pretty liberal people. They're, I don't have a ton of real life conservative friends. And I've never encountered someone who said, hi, I'm X and X and these are my pronouns because I think I would just you know, like, okay, um, I'll call you by your name. I don't care, but like, I don't really care about this pronoun thing. And now the gender thing, and what was interesting, and I'm, and I'm probably going to go into this on my podcast a bit, is the Dylan Mulvaney Bud Light thing. That to me turned out to be something where I thought this was just an online thing. Nobody's going to care about this. And as you see these reports of sales dropping, um, I started playing softball for the first time and talk about a culture that's, you know, it's like whatever. pickleball. And, Oh, it's uh, just the dudes, the suburban dudes with like the, you know, the Bryce Harper face paint. Yeah. It's a, just an entire culture that I don't, I'm, it's fascinating to me, but I'm in line at the concession stand uh, to get a beer at the, at the softball game. And there's two dudes in front and they made a look, they made a joke about Bud Light. And there's like, I can't be seen with the Bud Light thing. And I was like, oh shit. Like this isn't just, yeah. this one isn't online. Like this, this yeah. one somehow seeped out into the real world. Yeah. And I wouldn't even argue it was Dylan Mulvaney being, you know, trans or whatever. I think it was more to do with the marketing team calling their base a bunch of drunken frat boys. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that had more to do with it than it had to do with, you know, uh, Dylan Mulvaney pushing Bud Light or whatever. But yeah, the, the gender thing is, and you're right, it's so rampant. And I think the reason it's rampant uh, is I genuinely believe this, that when Elon Musk bought Twitter, and I don't believe he is the bastion of free speech that he says he is or that some of his hardcore people on Twitter say he is. But there's definitely laxed rules. And before he bought Twitter, can you imagine the Dylan Mulvaney discussion under the old Twitter, under the old regime of you know Alejandro Carballo and those people running Twitter essentially, where if you even questioned what Bud Light was doing, you're probably going to lose your Twitter account. Yeah. And so what I the reason why I think this debate is everywhere now is because the other side is now allowed to engage in it. Yeah. Uh, there was there was no engagement on this topic. You were going to be platform deplatformed. You were going to be banned if you even questioned a lot of this stuff. And now that you know Musk has kind of cracked the door open a little bit and said, "No, you guys can come back. You come on, come on." I think that the other side is allowing their point of view to get out there, and now it's just kind of this full-on Twitter rubbernecking war. Most of which I'm not interested in. Some of which I think is fascinating, interesting. Some where I think it's leg there are legitimate things to look at this stuff as far as politically and in school curriculums. Um, but I kind of get off the bus when it's like, we're going to go harass target employees, which I wrote about. I'm, I'm kind of like, that's where you lose me. And I think that that's where I'm on the older end of the spectrum where it's just kind of like, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to go protest target guys. I, I don't care. I don't care <laughs> if a private bar has a drag queen. I don't care. I think I had my 36th birthday at drag queen bingo in Manhattan. Like yeah. I don't care. I, I think the re, you know when you're when you're basically like hey we're gonna shove drag queen junk in front of kids faces I'm like yeah that shouldn't happen at school but if it's still at a private bar these are still parents taking their kids to brunch you can you can disagree with it not my thing um, but they're walking a fine line between I think legitimate arguments between what's in school curriculums uh, permanent hormone therapies and surgeries and also we don't like that rainbow colored swimsuit get rid of it there there is an element there is an element right now of march simpson trying to bulldoze the bordello <laughs> where you know it's like the beloved springfield bordello and she's sitting there trying we got to get rid of this stuff we got to get rid of this and then the bordello go down, goes down the list breaks into song and it's like oh we love the bordello now and that's <laughs> where i think the political right is it could be starting to lose that argument, which is you don't want to get people to start to love the bordello or at least make excuses for it when I think you were legitimately probably winning on the topic of what kind of literature is in school libraries, elementary school libraries. And also, hey, we don't think, you know, doing life altering surgeries for preteens is a good idea. I think if they focused on those two topics, I think you're going to win the argument. I mean, this is where it gets tricky, because when it comes to parental rights and I'm not exactly I, I feel like even a parent sh sh who gets to tell a parent if they should allow surgery for their team in this instance. And yeah, uh, well, the one example I think 
the one example I think the right has on this is we don't allow parents to get their kids tattoos in this country. You cannot, I don't even think a minor can get a tattoo with parental consent, even in states like California and New York. And that's, that's again, that's a permanent life altering thing. Now it's not necessarily gender identifying. Uh, I do see the, I do see what you're saying in the sense of if a parent signs off on the waiver and the kid's like, yeah, let's do it. And the parent's like, let's do it. And the doctor's like, okay, let's do it. Um, I do think you're you are walking into again that debate. And the, yeah, these are debates I, I don't we, I don't agree. These are with debates that. that we should these are these are debates that we should have. Right. And then again, you have one side of the aisle saying, no, we can't have these debates because you're gonna you're gonna get people killed. You're gonna genocide people. And then it's like, wait, what? Yeah. So um I, I do see that side of it, but when you look at just the laws that we already have in place, um, I see that side uh, of it, but I don't agree with it because I think so many people do this stuff for self-serving reasons, parents. So I'm not sure that I, but then it's, I, you know, I have my own internal debate about this because now that I have a child, it. How old, how old is your, is, is the she's rug, 13 the months, rug. 13 months. So yeah. She, so she's she already is, transitioned. She, just kind of, yeah, <laughs> she, she walked, she, she pointed in, a, she pointed I gave birth a to a boy. I just told yeah, everyone she, it was a girl from day she, one. She, she, <laughs> she pointed at GI Joe at target. Now you're like, we Yesterday, my husband actually took a video of her, and she walked right up to trucks, and I was like, "Oh, she's trans." Oh, that's it. Call the that's doctor. It. <laughs> yep, that's it. <laughs> she was uh, like, "Ooh, an interesting one. trucks." You took, yeah, right there. If you took your 13 month old and said, "Doctor, my my 13 year old in in my 13 month old just looked at a truck. She's a boy." And the doc, it'd be interesting to see the doctor go, "Okay, sure, let's go." Let's. <laughs> there are doctors who will. This is a discussion I'm really I, I'm I don't want to be obsessed with, but I, it consumes me because it's such the t- it's hard to ignore, but it's the tip of the spear. When I see comedians doing joke, what like comedian after comedian after comedian doing a joke about a topic, I know that it's something a you're not allowed to joke about in society for whatever reason, and b that it's the tip of the spear of some kind of something. And yeah. this is something. Well, that's, and that was that was Dave Chappelle. What was interesting about the, the argument that they make is that if you make jokes about this, if you even breach this topic, you're putting you know trans lives in danger and they're going to get killed or there's going to be this. And the only person that I've seen attempted to get murdered over a Dave Chappelle trans joke was Dave Chappelle when right. the guy jumped on stage <laughs> with like a gun knife or something. And uh, they they really tried to ignore that part of it. And Dave Chappelle is obviously inconvenient to them because this, if you kind of look at the revolution where we're at, the, the start of these moral panics that have kind of been cascading for the last five or six years, it really started with George Floyd. And then it became kind of more and more of these advocacy and these social groups said, well, what about us? Where is our attention? How, if you look now, you have Ben Collins from NBC say that DEI now includes gay people. And it was like, it never was meant like, what? It's it, That was never the argument. This was about, uh, you know, DEI, including diversity, equity, inclusion based on, you know, a racial profiling, a racial grievance, whatever you want to have it, led by Robin DiAngelo and Ibram Kendi that was then wholesale adopted by the media and the Democratic Party as a platform. And now it's kind of like turned into the trans gay debate. And it's weird how that happened, even to the point to where they changed their flag to like include all of this stuff. And right. That's what I think is really a, 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 an unexamined thing about all of this is how these different kind of advocacy groups, and I, I don't even say communities because I don't think the black community is, you know, on board with a lot of this stuff. But you have ag- advocacy groups, and they're all kind of trying to now out attention each other on these topics. So if you look at it, we're not even talking about really the the George Floydism that came out of, you know, 2020 and the riots and the the election and whatever, Um, we're we're now fully on to the gender debate. And I'm fascinated about how that was able to be accomplished while they've, while they're now co-opting, you know, the black movement and saying, well, this is also about us. (laughs) Yeah. It's kind of like, not, not really, but it is interesting how that was able to just kind of overtake that whole debate. And you're right when it's like now comedian, if comedians are out there able to kind of joke about that. And again, Chappelle is, is very uncomfortable again because of his race. And he even talks about that. He talks about how, you know, 
he had trans activists talk about how he did he he doesn't know to be this kind of victim and it's like do you see what i am yeah. do you know how i made my career <laughs> yeah. like and he goes into that he goes into that different thing about your it feels like this movement is trying to be is trying to co-opt 400 years of of black suffering and yeah. there is an aspect of it to that that's really unexamined women too and Oh yeah, that's you know I've I said uh, numerous times on my podcast that if this college sports stuff is going to be solved as far as you know biological males and college sports, youth sports, it's not going to come from me. It's not going to come from a conservative pundit on the right writing words at you know the New York Post. It's going to come from feminists. It's going to have to come from the feminist left, where it's like you know what, dude, literally, dude, we're an ally of you, and you're making a mockery of this. Like we're trying to be supportive of you, and that's what South Park tackled. It said, you know, we're trying to be supportive of this. We we are trying to be inclusive of you. And here you are just like stomping over my daughter's head uh, on your on your way to a track win. And I don't know if they're there yet, but I know, you know, you can start to see it creep in on social media, long term, long term feminists that I've known, either on the left or whatever that I followed, you can start to see them start to just ask these basic little questions about stuff. And that to me is where that has to be dealt with. You know, guys like me or guys like Chris Rufo or whatever, you, libs of TikTok, they can scream about this stuff all they want and it's just going to look like a hardened culture war. But when you start to get the political left and especially, you know, old school feminists who are out there kind of going, you know, I, th I think it was Martina Navratilova who even said, you know, but this she got isn't destroyed right. for it. Yeah, but she did. But see, that's the thing is she's on the older side of it. And it's kind of like saying, you know, Bill Maher gets destroyed for this because he's kind of an older guy who it's like, I don't fucking care at this point. Um, and so it, there has to be more of that. And I, I appreciate someone like Riley Gaines who comes out and is like, no, I'm against this or Leah Thomas's, you know, co-athletes are now speaking out. But what fears me about that is Leah Thomas is going to take the, you know, the, uh, the check for T, you know, TPUSA or whatever, and become that kind of person. And that automatically to me kind of says, all right, well, now you're, now you're a political star. You're going to tour the country. It reminds me of like Riley Kyle Gaines will? in a way. Yeah. 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 Or no, I didn't say she will, but it, if you're, if you're become, if you're getting sucked into kind of the TPUSA culture, that's where I, I just, I'm kind of like, don't do this. Like you can be such an important, it's sort of, sort of like Kyle Rittenhouse where uh, I, I think that the correct decision was made in the Rittenhouse case. He was not guilty of the charges against him. And now he's making like the conservative all-star talking tour. And it's kind of like, kid, kid, go away, go to college, go live your life. You and, I, you and I talk about this a lot where we say the, the political right doesn't know how to take a W. And I, I think I see more and more of that as I get older. Yeah, they they seem to be. So I've been obsessed with this whole thing You're cause, because I don't think enough people have really dug into it. And I've been working on a piece basically since last week where I feel like I'm interviewing kind of murderer, ro murderer's row <laughs> of thought criminals. Um, yeah gay liberals and conservatives about this backlash. And you know, I'm like, why aren't we hearing from the actual gay people who have had to live through this? And so I was like, well, why aren't I interviewing them? And so, you know, Douglas Murray said a lot that really stuck out with me, but he made a point that the UK- Pretty good thought crime leader. Oh there's, God, there's I love him. Good, I love yeah. him. The He made a really great point that the UK is much further ahead than the US on this conversation and debate because they had people because of the women and they have all of these women who have spoken out feminists liberals lesbians and who have been assaulted and getting before. assaulted but he said they had someone like jk rowling who from the very beginning was vocal about this and he his kind of theory is that if somebody like oprah had come out of that stature that much of a celebrity and said no, this is about like women are losing rights here. This is not, we need safe spaces for women that we would be further ahead. But because nobody has, we're very far behind most of the Western world on this. I think that there is, and and that's a great example. And I think that this, and this is what to me is fascinating about somebody like Robert Kennedy Jr.'s presidential candidacy, which is the the progressive or liberal and media driven orthodoxy in this country is like, you know, you shut up and you go with what is happening right now because um, there, there's so much power behind it. And they kind of see what happens if you speak out and whatever. 
and J.K. Rowling's easy because she had fuck you money. She can say whatever she wants. But she and, still and she took know, a, And she knows she, it. She can, and but she, she still took a risk at great expense. Oh, of course you know, she did. She, oh, she has she fuck did. you money, but she's still, people are always like, you could have just been silent and retired with your billions. It's like, yeah, yeah. you think that's an own? She didn't. Yeah. She, <laughs> yeah. she, um, but I, I think that the, especially in America, because the hierarchy, especially the liberal elite wants to be so accepted and whether that's accepted in Washington, whether it's accepted in corporate media, places like, you know, Atlantic book parties. And I know that that's a cliche, but those do go on. And I know because I was invited to a couple of them and I didn't go um, too, too much to the how you how could you turn this down? And I'm just like, I don't want to fucking go anywhere near those people. Um, but there is this idea of just you have to go along with this. And this is what's interesting to me about Robert Kennedy, who I wrote for on Newsweek about, and you and I talked a little bit about it. Which yeah, is, I, I told you to write I the piece. I don't, I don't agree. <laughs> yeah. So I got I, re I got rejected at three outlets for that piece. And maybe I'm just a bad pitcher, which I can kind of be. But um, And then, you know, Batia is like, yeah, do it. Like, I love her. This. And yeah. I think what's interesting about his candidacy is he's the one guy out here saying, we don't have to go along with this. A good example is Ukraine. Um, you can think whatever you want on Ukraine, but this kind of this demand for national unity to support Ukraine, which is Joe Biden's war, which then it becomes MSNBC and a corporate media's war. It's a good thing and you must support it and you must wear the flag and you must do this. And uh, in, in all in in all honesty, yeah, I think Putin should be defeated a hundred percent. Like I look at this as a war of aggression. I question the consequences that led to it, but I'm one of these guys where uh, I support Ukraine and I don't believe a single thing that my eyes see on social media coming out of it. Right. Whether it's pro or anti, which is why I don't talk about it. I just I, there's video clips and there's dams blowing up and there's pipelines blowing up and there's everyone. Over, and I'm just kind of like, no, I don't believe any of you. And that largely isn't to do with that. It has to do with the media uh, since going back to me being, you know, weapons of mass destruction and the Iraq war kid. Um, I just don't believe you anymore. And what's interesting is RFK Jr. is out here saying we don't have to be, the, the Democratic Party doesn't have to be the party of endless wars. We don't have to be the party that supports the intelligence state, which is, we just saw Raphael Warnock today come out and call attacks on the FBI unconscionable. Uh, he should look up what Martin Luther King said, you know, what the FBI thought about him in his home state mm -hmm. uh, going back a few years. And so, you know, it, it really is interesting how the Democrats have become kind of the, the corporate elite party of endless wars, you know, Raytheon and, and billions of dollars. Pfizer. And then also Pfizer farm, big pharma is another one. Um, big and the other, you know, help us big corporations fight Ron DeSantis. That's another fun one. Uh, how they become the pro corporation party. And here you have RFK out here kind of saying, like, I don't want to be the party of the intelligence state. I don't want to be the party of endless wars. I don't want to be the party of big corporatism. I don't want to be the party of big pharma. Uh, that was all kind of like George W. Bush era politics. And I don't want that. And he's he's gaining 20, 22 percent in polling. One simply as a protest vote for the DNC saying we're not going to allow any debates or primaries for this 80 year old guy who can't stand on his feet for longer than five minutes. <laughs> um, but he's also giving voters and Democrats a way to kind of go. Yeah, we don't really like doing this either. But uh, no, hooray. Yes. No, no, no. We really don't want to do this anymore. We, we really kind of don't support all the millions to Ukraine and stuff. And that's. That's what's fascinating to me about him is I don't support him and whatever. Um, I, I think he has a lot of kind of kooky, crazy stuff. But what's interesting is the more you try to shut up kooky, crazy stuff, the more traction it gains in this day and age. Yeah. And his the reason why he's getting that exposure is a lot because of the do with the censorship that came out of COVID from the biomedical state, from the NIH and stuff, because um, the more that people realize that a lot of that stuff was politically driven and wrong, here you have a Democrat coming out here and saying, yeah, I don't like Fauci either. That gives that gives a way for the burden to be lifted off of Democratic voters to go, oh, thank God I can stop pretending to like this guy. Yeah. And I think that that's what's interesting about him. But as far as like that gender debate, you know, that's what a lot of it is. It's a lot of people on the political left and embedded in media. It's like, nope, I don't want to rock the boat. This is we got a good thing going here. We're in charge of the country and whatever. And even if I speak up and go, hey, maybe that guy body slamming that high school wrestling student isn't a good idea. They know that if they speak up, it's like, oh, no, that's it. You're off. You're out of here. 
And uh, that's that to me, and this is what I'm going to go into kind of this week with my podcast is that's what was so interesting about banning this trans influencer from the White House for going, you know, topless at the Pride event. Yeah. So wait, what happened with that? They banned them. Yeah, they banned this person. So uh, and who uh, banned again, them? I, the White House. Yeah, the White House said that this person will not be invited to future events for <laughs> for taking off for taking off their top at a pride event. And this was, you know, it's like, you know, act you can argue what you can you can make any argument about whether you support it or not, but it's like, have you seen a pride event? Like, have you, you know, it's all about the cel- the celebration of sexual perversion. And I'm not denouncing that necessarily, but that's kind of what it is. It's celebrating, you know, other the otherization of sexuality. And so you invite all of these influencers to the White House and Joe Biden gets up there and he's like, yeah, transgender people or whatever. And you do this and then they all kind of like throw their tops open and it's like, how dare you? There are children present. And that's kind of like where people like me go, wait a second, this is where you drew the line. Like you want like gender queer being read to second graders, but that's where you drew the line. Like who, again, this who like, got mad? Did people on the left get mad about this? So I think it was originally, no, it was originally Charlie Kirk. Saw, oh, right. That I makes think sense. It was Rose, Rose Montoya's, whoever Rose Montoya is. This is another one where these characters just pop up and now it's like, oh, you live up there now. Um, so <laughs> this, these trans influencer goes topless at the White House, gets a photograph and a video with Joe Biden and then takes the top off and – Charlie Kirk spreads it. And then I think Fox news picked it up. And then I think some other outlets picked it up and then the white house, and then they asked the white house for a comment on it. And the white house is like, Oh yeah, we can't have this happening on the South lawn. We can't. You know, yeah. This person's not no longer invited. <laughs> and that, that to me only fuels fire to this now because it's kind of like, um, like, okay, so these, this is, this is a biological male with, you know, artificial breast implants, great ones. I might add like, I mean, come on. Um, I think nice. you even said, like, thank you to the conservative right for all the boobies in my feet. To, to Which is the thing. other <laughs> irony is no one's spreading that stuff more than conservatives. And I love, too, when conservatives get all, like, pearl clutchy and what, what, what about this? This should not be allowed in the White House. I'm like, your dude got, got like, he banged a porn star and got yeah. in trouble for it while he was president. Yeah. What are you talking about? Yeah. Or, I mean, then, of course, you had, like, how Bill Clinton has defiled the office and stuff. And so to kind of treat it like a sacred ground i kind of agree it's like not appropriate for an official state event Agreed. but i also think we we blew past that line a long time ago <laughs> um, <laughs> i'm not saying turn the white house into a brothel but it kind of already has you know we can thank um, jfk for that <laughs> yeah and and countless others yeah. like while we're at it but yeah i mean the, this the, the thing with how the white house is like this is inappropriate for a pride event and it's like this is the thing with having an 80 year old Joe Biden in charge. Like, do you know what happens at pride? Like I keep like thinking like Joe Biden stumbles into the blue oyster club from police Academy, you know, like that's how he views gay and trans events. Like, you know, he walks in and he's like, why are all these dudes wearing leather? You know, I mean, and that's kind of how they acted. Like, it's like, I mean, what did you expect <laughs> from, a, from a pride event like that? You know, just someone removing their top is pretty tame for a pride event. Yeah, okay? you're lucky like, he like, didn't pee in it. someone's mouth. Yeah, yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, or at least offer to. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, a pride event is is, is that the perfect place where you invite Hunter and say, "Man, go oh, nuts! Wow, you're ready to go." And so this idea that it's kind of like we don't we don't endorse this. It's not what this is about. That's where I see kind of the nefariousness of we're not going to tell you what's involved with a lot of this stuff. And this is how I've said it to this day. I don't know how Ron DeSantis backed him into the corner of defending gender surgeries for minors. I don't know how he did that. Um, but, but he, he came out what, like a year ago and said, we're going to we're going to ban gender surgeries for minors. And reflexively, the Biden administration, simply because he was for that, they put Rachel Levine out there and go, no, no, you, we're going to allow this. And everyone, like 70, 69, 78% of the country is like, no, we're not for that. And of course, that's when they change it to gender affirming care, because that's a broad political term that implies it's health care. And they won't tell you the specifics of right. what exactly is involved in that. Right. And that's, to me, the question that has to be asked of them. So when Joe Biden is up there on a debate stage and he's like, gender affirming care, you know, falls over, you have to say to him, what do you think that is? What does that entail? Are we talking therapy? Okay, I'm for therapy. Let's do that. Are we talking for permanent hormone replacements? Are we talking for surgery? Yeah, I don't think many people are for that. 
And so that to me is very reminiscent of what we saw at the White House's reaction to this Pride event, which is that's not what this movement is about. And it's kind of like, it's not that it's not about that. It's that you're embarrassed by it. And now you had to speak out and condemn it because you know how that looks to most people who see that photo. Right. Whether or not you agree with it or not is 100% beside the point. But don't sit there and bullshit to us that what this is about or what it isn't about. I really feel like you are one of the most refreshing people in, in my timeline and life. And when there's something going on, I'm like, I, and I, cause I don't know enough. I don't have enough of the historical knowledge because I did stumble into this in 2015 and I didn't even know conservative media existed. <laughs> you know, I think I, I was aware of it, but I didn't know it was more than like Fox news and rush. And yeah, I was I, I was an I was an Andrew, Andrew Breitbart guy pretty much through and through. Mm -hmm. He was kind of my political north star, which I'm sure since since you're right, you've heard a lot about him from a lot of people that knew him. People and say I remind them of Andrew Breitbart. <laughs> yeah, I, I get some of that too, and I'm kind of like, yeah, that's, you know, there's not really another one of him, and that's that's why. And I do think, you know, I, I remember waking up and seeing Judge Report in 2012 that he had died. And I, I was just kind of like, what the fuck do we do now? That was my first thought, like, because he was a guy to me who he, he showed you that you don't as smart as guys like Charles Krauthammer are. And there's another one that will never be replaced. But and George, yeah, and George Will and these guys, you Breitbart was kind of the sweaty Los Angeles entertainment culture guy. And he was the one where he basically said to me, hey, look, you don't have to be George Will over here. You don't have to be kind of the William F. Buckley. And, you know, and I work for National Review, so no, nothing on him. But you don't have to be the kind of conservative leaning back in your chair, looking down over the glasses kind of thing. You can be a little rough around the edges. You can curse. You can, you know, look a little disheveled. You can talk about movies. You can talk about entertainment. And you can do so in a way that you don't have to withdraw yourself. And, you know, I, I am one of those guys where I am a, I'm a big film guy. I'm a big music guy where probably 98% of the bands I listen to will probably hate me personally. But that doesn't mean I don't like their music. Right. Um, it, it doesn't mean I'm, I'm not going to go see a Sean Penn movie yeah. um, or anything like that. But he was kind of the one that, you know, he was the first kind of mainstream cultural conservative where he was plugged because he lived in Los Angeles. He didn't live in, you know, kind of a red state. He was plugged into what these people were talking about. And so that to me has always been more important again, is like I said, than reading what's at national review. And like, I love everybody at national review, but like I said, I know what 98% of them think. And <clears throat> you're not going to win arguments if you don't know what the other side is talking about. And I think that that's what he was really big on, but at pretty much ever since his departure, there's been kind of this wrestling match over, you know, who takes his place. And a lot of imitators have popped up and a lot of them dishonestly. So, um, but what's interesting is, you know, Ben Shapiro came from Breitbart and he was able to kind of go off and launch daily wire, which I think is the closest thing to it since then. Um, and so that's been interesting to watch, it's, but there's been so much of this trying to fill the void that, uh, I was kind of one of these guys where I was like, I'm not going to try to fill that void. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, maybe that's cowardice. Maybe it's whatever. Um, but I think you do still, especially in this day and age where we're getting older and a little bit, you, you have to, you still have to question about why you're doing this and you still have to believe in, you know, what you're doing. You still have to believe that what you're doing is righteous and you, you don't have to go for the, you know, the $5 million paycheck to be a Fox News contributor. You don't kind of have to do that. Um, a good night's, a good mm. night's sleep is a lot more important sometimes. Yeah. The money I've turned down is actually sometimes makes me sick, but yeah. Um, as I but have, you're independent. I mean, you, you're doing your own thing as kind of an independent media. And what's, that's also where I do think a lot of the future is going. Um, a it's, lot of people want to try it's and it's not in, Go on. Sorry. No go, no, go ahead. A lot of people, your show. Uh, no, just a lot of people, because I think I see you get this to a certain extent. I probably get it more because I'm a little bit more wishy-washy and not as certain about things. But a lot of people want to be like, don't you see? You have to take this like, ex like everybody's radicalized. You need to get on a side. And the, the left is dominant and I've pushed back against them. But then every time I'm like, OK, maybe I can go. The right does something where I'm like, you guys are fucking crazy, too. Every time I'm like, OK, maybe I can say I admit it. I I lean a little more right. They'll do something where I'm like, yeah, no, you're nuts. Like you guys, like we said at the beginning, you can't take the W. And then you have um, and Trump just I still find the guy just absolutely repellent to me just as a as a human. 
And I don't think you can force being something, I mean, many people in our media ecosystem are shameless and do, but I can't, as a friend says, I like mirror, you know, he's like, I like mirrors too much. Like I, I just I want to be able to look in the mirror. I can't be, I'm, I'm very confused about a lot of these things. I really am just an average idiot who stumbled into this kind of in 2015 when most Americans got caught up in it because Trump yeah. exposed, right, you know, exposed so much of the hypocrisy and insanity. And what do you make of, well, for two things, what do you make of the, the kind of, you talk a lot about, you you spend a lot of time pointing out hypocrisy on your Twitter, which is why I love it, and make the point that it's kind of hierarchy and not necessarily not hypocrisy, it's hierarchy. You know, there's that yeah. point that you make. What's the deeper point people, you wish people would take away from that, the kind of work you do? That That's a good one. I, I wish, I guess I look at it and I say, I wish people would pay more attention. And I, this, there's a reason, I, I mean, I host a thing called the Versus Media Podcast and I use Versus because it's Versus Us, it's Us Versus Them. Mm -hmm. And you're right about the hierarchy. And, and you know, I, I look at it and I, just, I, I wish people would understand that you do have a voice, especially when it comes to social media platforms. And, you know, it, it's, it's interesting, especially in interactive media online, where you don't have to like show your face, you don't have to be who you are in your real life. And I look at a lot of, especially pundits on the right who look at that as a bad thing. Um, Jordan. Anonymity, it's like you, you, <laughs> you anonymous, yeah, you anonymous coward or whatever. Yeah, um, so or whatever. weird. But I, I look at it and I say, you know, that, that to me is – a pleasure of the internet in the sense of like a lot of people need that for their jobs. They can say what they want. Some of my favorite Twitter accounts out there are anonymous accounts. I, some of them, I know who they are um, just through shared information, but some of them I've known for 10 years and I couldn't tell you who their real name is. And I wish people would kind of realize the importance of their voice on that. And that's, that's kind of how I've tried to use my Twitter is, is I kind of gained up and up and up. And the last landmark I hit with Twitter is when I passed Iowa Hawk blog mm, in followers. That I was the him. last like important thing. Cause when I first got on, he was one of these guys who's an anonymous guy just posted this stuff. And I'm like, I'm going to gravitate towards him. Yeah. And he was really, when I passed him on followers, I cause you, you get know, a little tear. I, yeah. I told him. And I kind of have said, I want to use this platform to say, to kind of not retweet the elites of the elites and whatever like that. And my, and my pundits and media, you know, or my, or my friend writer at the Atlantic or whatever, because I don't really have those people. Um, I, I want to kind of elevate, you know, even people with lower followers and say, these are, these are people that actually know what's going on. And this is what was so fun about, it. I did a live podcast app on Colin for about a year and I would talk to real people. And, you know, uh, one of the best episodes that I've had, and they've all known this, is after the Uvalde school shooting, um, there was the argument over single door entrances in school. Mm. And that's what they had. It's just one was propped open and the dude just walked in the back door and went in and started firing off. And you had kind of like intellectual people on the left. I think it was in response to a Ted Cruz tweet about single door entrances at schools. And it, you had guys like Tim Miller from The Bulwark, who's also on MSNBC, just laughing at this, like being the cool kids table. Like, <laughs> my preparatory school had like 13 entrances. How are you going to do that? And what, and you had a whole group of them doing this. So I got a call in that night, and that's where people can – it's similar to Twitter spaces. And the topic was, does your kid have a single entrance school? And I think I talked to 20 people that night, and every single one of them said, when I drop my kid off at school, I have to drive up. They walk the kid out, put it in my car, and I have to drive off. I cannot enter the school. There's one entrance. Yeah. If I go to that entrance, I have to be – but. and it's just – that's what I love. And that's what I love about independent media, and that's what I love about social media is you can have somebody like that who has an audience on MSNBC or an audience at you know a, a website or a publishing site – spew this absolute inane bullshit. And here you have on social media, you can have, everyone has the ability to counter that. And that's what I think is so valuable about community notes now on Twitter, which is a way of saying, hey, instead of quote tweeting or abusing or whatever, it's a way of like animating a tweet to say, hey, you're wrong on this. Here's the source. And then everyone can just blow that up. And you don't know who posted that. It could have been, you know, a guy who's in a Mensa with a Twitter account. Right. Or it could be, you know, Chunky Joe 69 lover 59. And he just happens to know this stuff. And that's, that's to me what I kind of wish people would know to use their voice other than to just like shout 
MAGA 2024 into the void. I feel like that's um, where you and I are very similar. That was kind of how I used my column at Playboy because it was a very strange time to be writing two and four and about men in 2015. Yeah. And then I started talking to that. And they, it was like, I, I keep saying I would get thousand word essays from these men just for asking them a question. And I'm like, no one's asking these guys how they're doing or what's going on with them because everyone's like, shut up. You're a white dude. We don't want to hear up, from you. Man. Yeah. Shut up, white man. Not even white like, too. It was you've, like, you've been, you've been talking, you've been talking for 2,500 years. It's our turn now. Yeah. Which I mean, there's, there's uh, some legitimacy. Of course to that, but, there is. Of course um, there is. But we're we're, I, we're now is, at the point where it's like, even your existence is just too much. But this is another thing Douglas Murray said, you have to, how are you? in victory. So even if you get a seat, if suddenly you are given power, how are you going to use that power? Are you going to use it to silence white people now that now you're just behaving? It's the pedagogy. How do you say that word? Pedagogy? I always mess you're up. You're asking the... I am I am made fun of for how I mispronounce. I words mispronounce constantly. words all the time. So you're, you're, but if there's you're a book, the wrong guy. Um, pedagogy of the oppressed, and it's all yeah. about this. Essentially, the oppressed becomes the oppressor when they get any power. And this is a point Douglas Murray was making about pr modern pride and the LGBTQIA plus movement. He was saying, you know, you can't you can't be bullies to a minority because you are even if this is like the majority believes in the gay rights and whatnot you can't silence christians who might hold a different belief than you and well, and that's that's what we're seeing with you know with athletes and corporate pride we saw that especially what kind of got the whole ball rolling with sports was uh ivan proganov from the uh philadelphia flyers who's russian orthodox and he stood up and he's like, I'm not going to participate in pride. Now, there's people who question his motivations for that. One is he has family in Russia, where if he does that, his family could be arrested or punished, or it strictly is it's his religious belief. And so when you say inclusivity, it doesn't mean excluding religion. Right. And that's, that's what we're now seeing with the LA Dodger thing that's happening. Um, but you had hockey players start to stand up and go, we're not going to come out for warmups. We're not going to wear the jersey. We're not going to wear the ribbon. And I, I basically said, you know, at the time that this is a, t and a guy who's a, I'm a hockey player and a hockey fan. Um, I basically said, if the NHL punishes this guy at all, I'm through. I will not watch another NHL game. I will not buy a ticket. I will not support them. And of course they didn't. They very wisely went, this is a player's choice and they can kind of do whatever they want. And then you had more kind of do that. And, <laughs> and that's then they exactly just right. faded like, into the does... bush like right. Homer Simpson. And now, and now you're seeing this. Yeah, you're seeing this now with the LA Dodgers in baseball. Mm. And you're seeing a lot of this now. Corporations are now starting to kind of pull back a little bit on the what I call the Southwest by, you know, South by Southwestification of pride, which is you're taking something that should have been a meaningful organic event or movement. And now you're like corporatizing it and you're making it uncool in the process. And you see them starting to pull back a little bit, especially with the things that happened with Target and especially with Bud Light. And if you, inclusivity means inclusivity. It means that if you have a party, everyone's invited and no, not you, you stupid Christian priest. And that I think is the only argument people like Murray and kind of where I believe is that we're making, I'm not a religious guy. Um, but I look at this and I'm like, we do have religious freedom in this country. And if, if just happens, if Chris Judeo Christian is white and male and white driven or what have you, which it's not, um, I it's mean, not, it's <laughs> not. And this is, this is what's interesting about what I also argued about RFK Jr. As far as in Newsweek, the piece was arguing he's, he's giving a vote. He's giving a voice to the anti-vaccine left and it's not just, you know, it's not Palisades just people moms. who are like, right. It's not just those, it's not Hollywood, although Hollywood, and you know, this is a bastion of anti-vaccinism yep. where they were, a lot of celebrities were happy to just let the media focus on, you know, crazy hillbilly, hicksy, mega Q, QAnon person who is not a celebrity or any power, but here you have, you know, CNN, you know, sir, what do you think about the vaccine, sir, sir? And they were kind of happy to do that because you didn't see a lot of celebrity driven campaigns about get the shot. You know, you didn't get, you know, Matt Damon out there and Ben Affleck saying it's important to get vaccinated. And the other, you know, the other demographic that is obviously very anti-vaccine that the media just will not, you know, focus <laughs> on is obviously African-Americans. Yeah. And a lot of those people are also religious. And so that's another aspect that's fascinating to me about RFK's candidacy, where it's kind of like you threaten me. I could be I could be a poor African American in the South, 
you know, in Georgia or wherever, and you just threatened my job because I have a 70 year history of vaccine skepticism or whatever. And that was my argument is there was no argument of persuasion with the Biden administration. It was get the shot or lose your job. It was, it was no, Hey, here, here are the that. benefits. It was, it was just pure. It's pure. We're going to OSHA mandate this unconstitutionally, but we're going to do it anyway. Yeah. Um, but they also but said no, that they were it, like that whole pandemic of the unvaccinated and the yeah, language around it. It was die. so oh, yeah, dehumanizing. <laughs> It was you're going to die. Yeah. If you don't get this shot and you're in for a winter of darkness and, and also you're going to kill your kids and your parents. Yeah. And again, our media was very content to say that, well, it's just MAGA voters who are against us. And they were happy to ignore two very important voting blocks with the Democratic base. And that was Hollywood and African-Americans. That to me is another thing that's interesting about RFK is he's he's going to he's shining a light on corners of the Democratic Party where the media is like, no, don't go there. Don't go there. Don't go. Oh, shit. Like we saw that with ABC News when they, you know, he spoke. Supposedly was starting to go into anti-vax and they cut him off and said, we're going to be cutting off this interview because he started talking about anti-vaccinism. And that just makes people go, no, I want to hear that. Yeah. Why, why is that? You know, why, why are you doing that? It was such a it was such a weird time in, in L.A. when that was happening at com in comedy clubs and the comedy clubs kind of all got on board and started saying um, we're going to require vaccinated cards and you have to be vaccinated. And my friends, African-American comedians were like, okay, first of all, I can't get any, any like black comedians on the shows. They're like, how am I going to get black comedians in on these shows? And then they're like, and it's fucking creepy. It's all white audiences. They were like, it's like this weird yeah, thing that happened. I'm like, no one's saying anything about this. Yeah. And what's interesting now, and I've, I've commented on this is just how, just how it's gone away. We went from like almost a lockdown, have your vaccination card and a lanyard around your neck, or you're not going to even get into a grocery store. And this is not 20, this is not March of 2020. This is not when, you know, I'm shopping with rubber gloves and a mask on. Okay. <laughs> this was like last 2022. Year. Yeah. Yeah. This was last year. <laughs> and now we're like in 2023. And Woo! Tits on the, podcast, tits at the White House. Tits at the White House. Yeah. Tits out at the White House. <laughs> But I was like, it's just gone. Like you still see a few people it's wearing so masks. Weird. It's okay, but it's like I haven't. I've been to shows. I've been to venues, yeah. and I haven't even been asked for my vaccination card. No, it's, it's just so you don't weird. care anymore. You're not seeing campaigns by Fauci to go out there and get boosted for a seventh time. And I think it's probably because they know how on one how populist is two how they demonized a lot of information that is now true. And uh, three, it's kind of like we we can't go back to this. And, you know, now you have the UK report coming out and, and basically saying, oh, yeah, this came from, you know, a, a bat's asshole in a lab. Sorry, folks. And somebody asked, you know, why are we doing this in the US? Why isn't there like a robust commission to get to the bottom of this, whatever? And I just post a photo of Anthony Fauci laughing. And it's that simple. Yeah. What do you make of Trump's arrest? Because he got arrested yesterday, right? Yeah, or, right, he yeah was... for the second time. <laughs> it's like, uh, and he's probably going to get arrested again a third time in Georgia. And it's just kind of like, uh, um, I don't know why I can't is, stop laughing about it. Like, it's, it's my only it's response. We're, we're in such a uh, an absurd place where in five in five short years, we went from Trump crowd saying lock her up to our media saying we this is a banana republic you can't go after political opponents to now no one is above the law like there was literally that shift that happened from trump saying you know he's gonna put hillary in jail in a debate to now biden's doj literally going after the the 2024 gop front runner still and it's well no one's above the law and it's that's why you simply have to reply when we learn that Jennifer Granholm perjured herself in front of Congress last week. She's above the law. <laughs> she's not going to be prosecuted by Joe Biden's DOJ. Right. And so I, I think it is mostly a couple of things. I think it is one. I think it is mostly political. Two, I think it is a way similar to prior to the midterms with the, the raid on Mar-a-Lago in August, convenient timing. It is the way to keep Trump front and center in the headlines to suck up any oxygen from any other GOP candidate. And we've seen this, that, you know, they've now galvanized behind him strictly because of this prosecution. And 
the third point I'll make, or well, two, I have two other points. One is uh, he makes it very easy for them to go after him. Uh, I, I don't think that the argument here is that he's innocent. I think that the argument here is we haven't prosecuted someone under the Espionage Act since like 1920 here, okay? And two, there he was being investigated uh, under the exact same – it's not so much what he was charged with. He, the, what led to the investigation was the exact same statute that they were investigating Hillary Clinton under. And the James Comey standard is this would be unprecedented for any prosecutor to take up, and we don't think that we could obtain a conviction should we do it. <clears throat> and I wrote that that's the standard now. You've now set – whether it's po politics or whatever, you've now set the standard. And there is an element on, I would say, the corporate political right that says, who is very vehemently anti-Trump, that says, well, now we reset it. So now that Trump has been charged, now we can go after other Democrats. And I'm like, how fucking naive do you think we are? Do you think that that's what's going to happen? That you think we're playing on an even board here? No, we're not. And so he makes it very easy to, to have this. He makes, he makes himself a very easy big target. And so it's not, the argument isn't that he didn't do it. The argument is, do we actually prosecute someone under this? And considering he is in the presidential race, he is the front runner to go up against Joe Biden or Gavin Newsom or somebody again. Um, and here you have his DOJ. As much as Joe Biden can say or his White House can say, I believe in the independence of the DOJ. I believe in the I'm letting them do their work. No, they fall under the executive branch. Joe Biden is responsible for this, whether he says a word about it or not. It's his Department of Justice. He appoints the attorney general. He sets the board for this stuff. And so it is a political prosecution. Trump makes it very easy uh, to be prosecuted in this case. And I guess my fourth thing on it is I said on my podcast is that we don't have to do this anymore. Like how how much longer are we going to entertain this stuff? Because we don't have to go along with Trump. You can cut him loose. Okay. We don't have to do this. And I'm one of those guys who went from screaming in 2016, uh, a national review that we don't have, we really don't have to do this, um, to kind of being like, okay, I guess we're going to do this. And, uh, you know, the joke I make is I, and it needs context as I always say, I'm part of the Batman Begins Caucus. <laughs> and someone says, what does that mean? Obviously, it's such a weird specific reference. Like, what does that mean? And it refers to at the end of uh, at the end of Batman Begins when Batman's wrestling with Liam Neeson on the train. And Liam Neeson's, you know, he take Batman takes out the train tracks and he's like, uh, have you finally learned to do what's necessary? Which means, you know, learn to kill people. And Batman looks at him and he says, I'm not going to kill you, but I don't have to save you. And then he goes Woof, out the back of the subway car. And that's that's the context behind every time I post that GIF, whenever Trump says or does something fucking crazy on True Social or whatever, it's, look, I'm not, I'm not going to go take a job at the Bulwark. I'm not going to go take a job at MSNBC. I'm not going to go do that stuff, okay? All I can do is say, here are other options. We don't have to keep doing this. Um, I understand you got three Supreme Court justices out of it, and you and you love all of that stuff. But there are other options now. We don't have to keep doing this. Yeah. And it looks like we're probably going to keep doing it. And so that's when I just go out the back of the subway car. <laughs> like I'm, I don't. I'm not going to set out to kill you people, but I don't have to save you if you choose to go this route. And that's you know I joke a lot, and I'm like, how how could I handle another Trump term? Should he win? And I do think. You know, if he gets a nomination, it's not a sure deal that he loses. I don't see how he could win given a map, but who knows? Um, you know, I get joked about like, could you do another four years of Trump? And I'm kind of like, no, I think I'll just go be like a hockey writer if that happens. You know, it's like that that would really be testing my commitment to the you know, commitment to the righteous cause and all of this. I do think there are more important fights out there than who's just gonna end up in the White House. You know, this this is what's interesting is I've, you know. For the most part, policy wise, I've always I was always kind of a fan of Paul Ryan. I'm one of those cut conservatives where I'm like, he's a very smart guy on policy. I understand why you don't like him on other things like this, but he's just on CBS News two days ago, you know, talking about how he's not a culture war guy. And I'm thinking, you can't do this anymore. This this is a different time. It's a different country than even 2015, where, you know, you can be a corporate media friendly conservative, you can be, you know, Asia Hutchinson going on MSNBC, you can be Chris Christie going on CNN, you can be Paul Ryan on CBS News. Um, and, and talking about, you know, when somebody says, you know, Republicans are enacting book bans, and you don't call that out instantly and go, hold on here, it's not a book ban, you can still go buy the book, it's, it's about curating what's in elementary school libraries. You can either be that or you can be what's you know been called now a fight club conservative, which is a term that Philip Klein from National Review adopted, which is basically 
conservatism on offense, which is kind of what Ron DeSantis is. It's it's not reacting to things that are done to you. It's saying, okay, um, we see what you're doing, and we're going to basically say we're enacting this law. We're going to do this policy that says we're not allowing this kind of literature in elementary schools, and we're going to make you defend it. And that, to me, is kind of where we are culturally in the sense of you know, we don't have to do this going down the road of an 80 year old Joe Biden and a 78 year old Donald Trump, which are, you know, the last of the boomers clinging on. To they're their not own even boomers. Relevance. They're not yeah, no, even they're, boomers. They're silent generation. Joe Biden, what was it? Joe Biden was born before Pearl Harbor or there's some st- there's some weird stat. Where I think they're he's both like, he's silent a- generation. <laughs> yeah. So like, can we even get a boomer? That's what I've been saying. Can we can we? Yeah, like they're. <laughs> And that's the thing, like Generation X is going to get skipped because of course. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is going to be president in, in four years. Oh, so God. It's kind of, and that's when, that's when like the Gen X just really drops out and it's like, that's it. We're, we're going, we're going to the island. We're going to be shepherds. We're unplugging. I'm not doing the Neuralink and I'm not going to wear the goggles. I think most of Gen X is moving to Portugal. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it is it a good time to be in Portugal right it's now? It's really fr- like every person I know who can work remotely is moving to Portugal with their family. Interesting. Because it's I have really a couple, I have friends in Portugal. It's really open to expats and I guess like there are so many American expats going there now and it's mostly Gen Xers who are just Oh, interesting. who are just like, it's, yeah, I don't want to do it. this. I, I mean, I, I'll I say that same anymore. thing to you. I don't need we don't need to do this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I said, there there are days when I wake up and I'm just like, I can't fucking believe this. And then uh, there's a lot of times when I'm still like, no, this is important. And you know, I've always said what what's kind of interesting to me is, and I'm not going to name names, but I've been around writers' rooms where it's it is kind of reactionary. It would be like somebody comes out and says something, or Trump will come out and say something, or Hillary, or or whatever. And it's like we need to write, we need to react to this. And there are definitely times when, you know, very smart, very important people that I've had a joy to work with. I'm just, I'm like, you're not in this. Like you're like, you don't, you have to be in it more than just getting up in the morning. Oh, I have to write a piece for spectator today, or I have to write a thing. You have to still kind of pick a topic that you believe in and say, this is important in the sense of, this is what I want. Today I wrote on Gavin Newsom, obviously running for president. Um, and people ask, well, how is that possible? Well, I was like, it's a non-traditional campaign in the sense of he's kind of waiting for Joe Biden to die, um, <laughs> which is basically what we are all doing. You know, every time this dude takes a spill on a stage, we all just kind of go. We made it. Get up. We made a joke. Like, on there's dumps. a forty percent. There's a forty percent chance if Joe Biden falls off his bicycle, he doesn't get back up. <laughs> we Gavin made a Newsom's joke. Counting on that. <laughs> Yeah, it is weird. We made a joke on Dumpster Fire this past week about um, how he's, we call him AI Biden. We're like, he's been dead for eight years. They just make him yeah. fall so that it seems like he's still alive. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't. What was so crazy about that is it's not the fall. It's that he tried to get back up and like his arm like turned to dust. Like you could see sparks flying out of his elbow. And he could not like physically get himself to his feet without three people helping him. He, he turned his Secret Service detail into the visiting angels. And, you know, and that's why I joke about somebody like Newsom. I'm like, he's clearly running. It's just a question of if Joe Biden lives or dies or if he withdraws. Or he sees Robert Kennedy hitting 30% in polling. And Newsom says, he's a nutball. What happens if I get in the race? And what's interesting to me about Newsom is he's on Hannity. He's out here kind of openly challenging Biden. And no one in the party is telling him to stop doing it. Yeah. No one is, you know, I know he signed like a, or he, you know, he did a loyalty pledge in a commercial, like I'm for Biden or whatever, uh, but that that's politics. Nobody yeah. gives a shit about that, but no one in the party is out here telling Newsom to shut up. And it's because that they don't really want Joe Biden either. And you're right when you say, you know, us on the right who, who don't really want to go through another four years or six years of Trump, or if he loses, he's going to run in 2028. I hope people are prepared for that one. Um, you also have a political left that know they are kind of stuck with this guy and they really, really don't want to be. And they, they are putting all of their eggs in the basket that Donald Trump is the political you know, nominee in 2024. And there are a lot of forces at work to make sure that that happens. It's really interesting because I'm I'm 
I can't see Newsom. He's so unpopular, but then I also underestimate how quickly people circle the wagons when they have to, because yeah. I just think of- and you, were, and you were a resident in California, so you get that witness firsthand. And I'm out here going like, there's a reason why just, he won't talk about anything happening in California. There's a reason why he's just constantly you know, talking about what's happening. I just in think there are too many California immigrants. There are just too many- yeah. In every state. I just don't know. People are so resentful of the California immigrants in their state. I'm in Texas now as one of them. And oh. and so it's definitely, uh, I mean, I've started trying to like write jokes where it's like, I know what it feels like to be an immigrant because the other day a truck pulled up to me and he was like, go back to where you came from. Is that because how you were driving? <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> they drive like maniacs in Texas. I love it. But yeah, yeah, yeah I thought the, they did the in California. Drivers. Um, yeah, the California drivers, I, s I swear. Yeah. So, no, it's it's been – I just wonder how. But then, yeah, pe the tribes will circle away. I just keep thinking we – on Dumpster Fire, we covered that insanely catchy jingle that was going around on TikTok with the Gen Zer who was like, please don't make me vote for oh, Joe yeah. Biden. And yeah. we still sing. I'm like, and they all had to fucking vote for Joe Biden. I think about they all that. All, they all did. And yeah. so, yeah. yeah I and, under they'll, and they'll do it again. Even if, if he's in the infirmary, you know, and doing like the one arm, you know, the weekend of Bernie's, they'll do it again. I mean, that's just, that's what politics is. But um, I, I do think that they're, they're looking for the off ramp and Biden might give it to them. Like he still has not really, made an official formal announcement he doesn't i know he did the video and stuff but he's not out there touring and he's not out i mean he's a he's a two a day week president right now and i think people see that and you know i, I think his party is every time this guy comes out and opens his mouth it's gibberish and nonsense and that's fine except the problem is is he selected a vice president who every time she opens her mouth it's gibberish nonsense <laughs> And so I, I think somebody like Newsom or even a primary candidate, they see that and they're like, we're going to jump in and it'll be like Bernie Sanders with Hillary. It'll be like, it's just Hillary's time. And then Bernie jumps in or even Obama. And they all just went, oh, fuck. Yeah, we're going over here. Like we don't, you know, whatever. No, we're with her. We're with you, bitch, but not right now, you know, and. Um, I do think that there is that political opening. And I mean, it's it's fun to theorize and it's fun to guess. But like, uh, like I said, my original point was just getting you still if, if you get into this and you kind of get into the battle and stuff, you still have to believe in what you're writing. You still have to believe in kind of what you're saying, especially when you're surrounded by so many people on both sides who don't. Yeah, <laughs> it does seem that way. Well, this has been amazing. I'm going to end with the same two questions I always end with. What is your oh, biggest defect of character? Oh, that that I'm too right. <laughs> You're too. <laughs> no. A oh, lot of people geez. would agree with that. Uh, too right. on, on the right. Very, on, on several meta levels there. Um, oh, geez. I don't know. I can be a, I can I can get a little... If I say self-obsessed, they're going to take that thing in the sense of like, you know, I mean, egotistical. No, I, I can get I can get a little self-obsessed into like, you know, whether it's topics in life or something like that. I, I don't let go of things very easily. So if I'm on something, I have to be on it until it's a project. If I have to finish it or whatever, or if, um, you know, if, if I'm having a discussion or not even an argument or debate with someone, it's one of those things where um, <clears throat> you think of the perfect thing to say an hour later. And I have a hard time not being the guy going, yeah, hey, you know, like that. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get better at that uh, as, as I get a little bit older and I've done some lifestyle changes and things like that. Um, so I'm trying to get a, a little bit better at that. But no, really, it's that I'm it's that I'm too right most of the time. I was like, is this an Adderall addiction? You're just like ability to just be like a no. dog with a bone on this stuff. It's no, amazing. no. No, I mean, maybe I should be on Adderall or whatever, but I've never have been. No, it's just, uh, I think I just, I have a head for it. Mm -hmm. And when you realize that you're good at something, it's probably good to pursue it, even if that's probably going to lead to an early death. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, um, but no, it's it, it's it's just something that I just, I got good at. And, and once you're in it, it's like, okay, I guess I'm doing this now for the next, you know, 20, 30 years of my life. And that's, that's another thing with it. Like, I'm very good with, you know you know, the pain of attrition. I'm, I'm, I'm able to, you know, in these issues we talk about where, you know, they're hard to take on school shootings, um, you know, the, the gender thing, whatever thing like that. 
I think you have to truly enjoy the fight of it. And this was another thing I liked about Andrew Breitbart. He truly enjoyed the shit stirring of it all. And I think you still have to enjoy being able to do that. And, you know, and then it goes with anything that you do. It doesn't even have to be this. If, if you're a, a fucking coal miner or a coder or whatever, you still have to be able to enjoy doing it. So it's, you know, I know we bitch a lot and, and you and I especially were just like, you get up and you, you see what Trump is screaming in all caps. And then it's like, fuck me, like, this is going <laughs> to be my day. <laughs> I joked about that with the Trump arrest last week. I'm like, I'm just glad this happened on a Friday or Thursday because yeah. then I only had to talk about it for one day. But so I, I kind of try to veer off and not people always ask why I don't talk about Trump all the time. Why I don't confront Trump all the time. I'm like, because there are other things happening that are interesting to me. Uh, there's there's right now there's the AI revolution, which is the most terrifying thing out there, uh, especially now that chat GPT guy is partnering with China. And I'm just like, there's so there's so many of these things that, you know, are right there in front of us that five years from now, it's sort of like the school uh, curriculum debate where it just happened. Nobody realized it happened until we had a pandemic where <laughs> parents heard what they were yeah. being taught. No, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> I know. Kids are being homeschooled and you have a parent in the back. They're like, like what, what the fuck, fuck are they saying? Did you just call, did you just call my eight year old a racist? <laughs> what? come here. And that's, people make that joke, but that's literally what happened. Yeah. It's kind of like, what's this lesson? What are you learning? Yeah. What do you, and, what is the gender know, beer bread, man? Like what is yeah. this? It's like parents were content to kind of drop their kids off, yeah. let them be brainwashed a bit, bring them home from school, help them with their homework, even if they disagreed with it, just put them to bed. Let me have a glass of wine and half a painkiller and let me pass out. And especially with the pandemic, you're, I mean, people make that joke with Zoom and, and, and homeschooling. People got a good glimpse into exactly the kind of thing you're talking about. It's like, wait, what's that lesson plan? <laughs> and I think that that's what led a lot to where we are. And so I do think as kind of these debates keep going, I'm kind of and with you on a lot of the- Sorry, go on. No, I'm, I'm just, I'm with you on a lot of the gender stuff yeah. where it's like, where the fuck did this just suddenly come from? And I'm more interested in finding out, okay, how did we get, where did this discussion come from? Now you see how it's being framed in our media, which is my kind of my bread and butter. Um, that's my bread and gender beer butter is, you know, how I see how media covers things and, you know, how they start to frame events in real time. Um, but yeah, we're things like AI to me are right where we were five years ago with this stuff, where if we don't pay attention to this shit, suddenly China's going to own it and we're going to kind of be like, oh, how did that happen? And so, yeah, I mean, there are things that are constantly moving to me that are interesting. And so it's not always just about the Fox News, CNN punditry fight that, that you always see. Um, there are offbeaten topics that I think are more interesting and, and worth covering. And then you have Christopher Rufo being like, I've been trying to tell you <laughs> yeah. about no, the curriculum. I mean, <laughs> yeah. And he's, I mean, he, he's one of these guys. And I talk a lot about people who just, they're in this either for the money or they're in for, you know, they're not really true believers. Um, he, he is a true believer through and through, and he knows his message and he's been doing it for so long that, yeah, he's kind of his guy with his moment in the sun. Um, right now. And and I don't think it's kind of like, you know, <clears throat> the way that they prop up, you know, someone like Charlie Kirk or someone like Matt Walsh, who I think Matt Walsh makes some great points. Um, not really my personal, you know, cup of tea as far as, you know, personality wise, um, whatever. But yeah, Rufo's a guy where you're right. It's his moment in the sun right now. And he's very educated. He's very good. And he's very open about what he's doing. And that's different and refreshing in politics. You know, when he, he, one of his opponents comes out and is like, Rufo is really trying to destroy the gay agenda, transgender agenda in uh, corporatism, whatever. And he just goes, yeah, that's what I'm doing. Thank you. <laughs> and I think that that's refreshing. Yeah. Th that's what's been interesting about interviewing all of these people for this is that the piece started with the question, are social conservatives going to repel moderates and independents by going after pride. And then I spoke to all these people about what they thought, um, thought about all of this, the conservative, the backlash, the conservative backlash, conservative media, re re you know, I think the daily wire is doing their own whole month of pride content. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and it's been, it used to be like, a, it used to be a parade. Then it was a weekend. This is what Douglas Murray said. Then it was a week. Then it was a month. Then it then it was a month. And now and it's now the holy it's month of Patagonia, Pride. Patagonia, it's summer. And no, no, now it's summer of Pride. Yeah. 
Um, I, and I'm kind of like, again, that's one of those things where it just kind of happened and it was just but like, it how did where it? The like, fuck? you start, that's the thing about this stupid piece is that it's forcing me to be like a fucking journalist and I, I want to yeah. be lazy. And you start going down the rabbit hole and for the things that all of these people who have lived this, thought about this, and been in this longer than me are saying is that modern pride is essentially anti gay. And when you start, yeah. because gender ideology is anti-gay, and this is not something that's There's, really we've seen being, that argument where it's not just it's not just the erasure of women; it's the erasure of, yeah. of homosexuality, yep. of same-sex couples. And we saw this now with Dylan Mulvaney, who's like he's he wants to now date women or whatever, but he's actually talking about trans women, which means it's just another man, which means technically you are two biological males engaged in a relationship. <laughs> You're just like, it's just the, the window dressing is different, which is, you know, fine. But again, don't sit here and tell us what this is and what it is. Yeah. And then you, they, you know, we start talking about the corporatization of pride and then how it got so corporatized, but then you start going down the rabbit hole of ESG and, and that's a whole, I'm like, this is why normal people, all they see is, is, you know, conservatives kind of rightfully reacting to some of these insane things that the left has been backed into a corner of getting behind in, in some respects, like gender affirming care and whatever else they've been party messaged into believing. And yeah, the, the, ES, the ESG stuff is, is insane. And it's and it's too it's almost too big for normal people to grasp. You can't. I, did, I had to I listen couple, to a James a, Lindsay a, podcast <laughs> for like I, I did, was like I did two I did two on it where I dove kind of into you know I'm like so when I started like seeing all the stuff and whatever and there are people who are more you know steep in it than I am but I kind of looked at it and said how do I make dumb people pay attention to what's this doing and no I'm not calling my audience dumb I'm not saying it but Normies. in the most base in the basic way you can put it what is this do like. What is it? What is the power behind it? Which is the most important thing. And how is it that you have so many of these powerful corporate media structures going along with it? Like what what is the what is the use of force here that they all went, oh shit, yeah, we really have to do this? Yeah. As opposed to them going, we don't have to do this. What are they talking about? No, let's just sell our fucking butterfingers. And it's like, liquidity. What are they doing? Yeah. And so it's a fascinating thing. It's and it and it falls also into that, you know, altruistic ideology that we saw with Sam Bankman Freed and, uh, you know, good causism and doing goodism and things like that. And it really kind of originated with the climate debate. Um, but now, yeah, it's infected every single part of this. And it is, again, talking about topics like AI, and that's just more fascinating that are out there. There are these things that they aren't conspiracies. They aren't, you know, things that Alex Jones rants about. They're not. No, ESG is they're not like something out in the open. It's not something that is not a conservative fever dream here. This is something that, yeah, is happening. Companies are admitting they're doing it and they really don't want people to find out about it, which is why the media doesn't cover it. It's exactly like what happened with the with the Pride event at the White House. It was, you know, woo boobies. And it was the White House going, this is not what Pride is. And it's like everyone going, yeah, that's exactly what Pride is. What? <laughs> Have you ever been to a pride parade? Have you ever? And you can argue, like, you know, like I said, parents taking kids to pride and things like that. You can, this is where I think the right loses the plot a bit. It's like, yeah, that's still a parent taking their kid to a fucking parade. Like, if you want to go after school curriculums, do it. I'm all for it. If you want to go after medical surgeries, do it. I'm all for it. But when you start, like, you know, throwing out the fact that there is a rainbow onesie on sale at Target, I'm just kind of like, you lost me there. So that that's, I really hope they kind of try to pull the reins in a bit because they, there they is won't. this feeling that you're on the verge of moral panic. They're, where they, it's like they're already you, there. If you, if, if you see a fucking rainbow in the sky, some dude's going to pull out his gun and shoot it on two <laughs> Yeah. Like, it's kind of like, <laughs> which would be cool. Don't get me wrong. But that's kind of where it feels like where it is. And that's kind of where I just, you know, eh, I, I kind of get off. What's your last question? Um, we just went on for like another 30 I minutes. I know. This like, happens a lot. This. It's all right. Um, yeah. What's your, what is your biggest asset? I, I have yet to be bought. And I think that. Uh, Not I, I even think, Saudi again, money? No, no. I'm. I've had I've had offers like I mean yeah, I've, I know. I've had those um, I've turned down television appearances that probably could have benefited me and I think again the reason is is you have you have to know what you're in it for if you want to get in this and just rile people up and have them send you checks okay that to me is on the people sending you checks um, I, I live pretty comfortably um, and I'm not I, I don't have to and I've had people say that to me in the past you know why don't you do, do X Y Z whatever 
Um, and I, I live pretty comfortably enough within, you know, the constraints of a pretty good budget that um, I don't really have to go and sell out yet. Maybe I will. Um, I'm not saying that I won't. Hey, if, you know, Ben Shapiro throws $5 million at me and says, hey, bring your podcast to Daily Wire. I'm OK. Maybe we'll see about it. Um, but I've turned down offers like that in the past. $50 million. <laughs> dollars. Sorry, yeah, I just got yeah. I wasn't even, I just I wasn't got even making I wasn't even making a Crowder joke there. <sighs> but like you just reminded me of that. And the reason is is I've never really been a Crowder audience guy. Yeah. Um, and so maybe that's also a testament to that. But um, and you know, it's it's definitely made me more, I, I want to say adversaries, not enemies, than friends. But it's one of the joys about not being engaged like directly in like Washington, DC, and I don't live in Brooklyn, New York anymore. I don't live in the epicenter of media where it's very easy to be that outsider. It is very easy to, you know, get away from a lot of that kind of book party style noise and just kind of focus on the task at hand. And so I would say as of now, that's probably my biggest asset is I enjoy being an independent media. I kind of, I kind of equate it to being an independent band, whereas, you know, I have my own audience. I go to my, I perform my own little shows and my own little clubs. Yeah. I'm not like selling out Red Rocks, you know, I'm not selling out, you know, <clears throat> empathy, you know, giant stadiums with my music or whatever like that. Um, but I'm pretty content to, to be that right now. Yeah. So that's not a promise of future selling out, by the way, <laughs> just because, you know, in case someone like uses this clip, like, you know, you said that you wouldn't get, and I'm going to be like, Hey, now I'm 50 and I have to start thinking about retirement. Yeah. So, so long suckers. And Trump won again. Now I really don't care. No, I mean, if, yeah, exactly. I'm taking all the money. I, yeah, I get, yeah. I get that. We, we really try to highlight, we do these letters from the politically homeless because I get so many emails from people just telling me their story of their kind of political evolution. And I really try to highlight just the, like, the normal people voices out there, because that I, I do feel like that's where you and I are very similar is just finding, finding those other, because I came up in a similar way where I was just kind of in the Thunderdome duking it out and making jokes and, and trolling people. Cause it was funny. And then suddenly you're like, Oh, here I, I always joke. I feel like I've been in like a improv for the past seven years where it's just like, yes. Yeah. And now I will go on Glenn Beck. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think Trump was a litmus test more than anything else. His both his candidacy and his election uh, was a was a litmus test for a lot of people, especially as it involves political entertainment, uh, political commentary, punditry. And you saw uh, one of my very first podcasts that I did for Versus Media. I had David French on, and and people know I'm friendly with David. I learned a lot from him at National Review. I don't really agree with a lot of his positions currently today, but I'm also I never understand the white hot rage he generates because he's such like a he's such a kind of quiet, meek individual. Um, he's confident in what he believes, and he's stubborn at times in what he believes. But um, I had him on my second podcast, and it was about the fracturing of conservative media, where prior to Trump. You could have, you know, Weekly Standard, National Review, Breitbart, and they would all kind of uniformly write the same stuff, some different stuff and others. And then when Trump came along, he really fractured all of that. He busted people into a million pieces. And, you know, I even say today there's not really conservative media. There's, I mean, there's Fox News, but – you know, would you consider the Bulwark conservative media? Would you consider the Dispatch conservative media? Would you still consider Breitbart conservative media? Um, there's several of these spinoff kind of outlets. You've written for Spectator. I don't even really consider Spectator conservative media. Yeah, they have, you know, conservative writers like you, like me, like Douglas Murray. I don't consider myself conservative. Other, right. <laughs> but, you know, they, they have such an eclectic use of voices. Right. And the thing that I said, one of the things I've always said, kind of going back to your last question is, the only thing that met when Trump won, I kind of I said, I'm not going to lose my mind over this. I think I just started laughing when he actually beat Hillary on uh, election night. I was in Utah covering McMullen's campaign thing. And when he won Wisconsin, every journalist in the room packed up their laptop and left. Wow. Like, that was it. It was like, come home. We got it. We got to put out the fires. And I just saw that. And I just laughed. I'm like, oh, I guess this is what we're doing. Um, <laughs> and what I mean by a litmus test is. I kind of said the only the only thing that matters about the Trump years is is who comes out who's worth listening to that comes out of it with kind of their integrity intact. And what I mean by that is there's a lot of anti-Trump people who sold their soul for an MSNBC career and there's a lot of pro-Trump people obviously that made, you know, ridiculous you know defenses of things that he has said and he's done. And 
the people that are kind of worth listening to are the ones that kind of go, yeah, that was good. And yeah, that was bad. Mm -hmm. And just because, you know, <clears throat> just because he nominated Brett Kavanaugh doesn't mean we have to go along with a clear smear campaign to keep this guy off the court or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that was really a good coalescing of what happened on the political right is even people who didn't like Trump were like, okay, Kavanaugh's where we're at now. And it's like all hands on deck. This is bullshit. We all see it. And that was one of kind of those moments. And kind of going back to what you said about the voiceless, in 2015, 2016, when I was National Review against Trump comes out, they fired kind of the first salvo. And the thing that with me is I took a lot of abuse for that because I was kind of the online guy at National Review. I was the social media shitster or whatever. So when that came out, it was just you know at me. And I enjoyed it. That was the difference. I enjoyed kind of the sparring of back and forth. <clears throat> but I was uh, – when I lived in Brooklyn – and I took a trip up like up to northern New York through, I think it was Harrison or Garrison, New York. You see nothing but Hillary signs and windows in Brooklyn and New York, whatever like that. And the further you kind of start to get out of the city, you start to see Trump signs. Yeah. And you're like, in New York? Yeah, like, whatever. that was California and too. And when uh, I was at a bar that night after, I'd just gone to dinner and I was at a bar. And there was a couple of guys who either cement mill or whatever – and they were doing Trump and they were talking about it. And I just said to him, it's like, hey, I'm, you know, I live down in New York City. I do writing and stuff like that. And I'm like, you guys sound pretty clear on this. Like, and what do you think about him and whatever? And they went through kind of piece by piece what they thought about him and through jobs and um, just jobs leaving their communities and whatever like that. And Trump was really that grievance kind of candidate at the time. And that was the first time I kind of went, holy shit, I think he's going to win. Yeah. And just talking to normal people, yeah. getting out of a lot of this stuff. And that's kind of where I meant in the sense of I, I it wasn't so much when he won that I was disheartened. I wasn't just like, oh, fuck, we failed or whatever. I was more fascinated with how he won and the 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 things that led to him actually winning. And part of that was a five billion dollar media campaign that assured he got the nomination. And then, oh, oops, we should have done that. <laughs> and oh, oops, we're about to do it again. There is a clear strategy to do it again. Yeah. And that was part of it. Other part of it was just people just had their voices ignored completely. And I, I don't necessarily think he's the right vessel for it, but he is at the time was the only vessel for it. And so my hope is that kind of gets refined into the right vessel, not just him. Um, will that happen? I don't know. But that was kind of how I'm a guy who was a never Trumper and I get attacked by never Trumpers. <laughs> it's kind of like, because I'm more fascinated with how it happened than, you know, this imminent threat to democracy. Oh, that we're also willing to hand a nomination to again. What happened with national review? Did you just leave to go be independent? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, yeah, no, it was just, they, they refocused some of their other stuff. So I was kind of there to do online. I was kind of there to do video um, and do some other campaign stuff. And then <clears throat> they just shook things up a little bit and they just refocused on some stuff and they kicked me to the curb. And so uh, I, I'll, I'll never forgive Char Charles Cook for that. No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, I, I still I still talk to Charles. I think he's probably one of the smarter voices in in all of media, period. Yeah, I like Charles. Um, and, he, and, he's, and he's also now a Florida man. So okay. he's a Jacksonville guy now, I think. So everybody. Well, this has been awesome. We'll have to have you back on when Trump wins. Um. <laughs> yeah, another... <laughs> I'll see you in another two and a half years. I'll have the, I'll have the beard down to here by now. Yeah. So. We'll both be peeing in jars because we can't leave the house anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll resume peeing in jars. So I've gone twice. I've gone twice since we've been here and I haven't even told you about where, that. So. Where can we find you? Your podcast? Uh, and I, do have, I do have a podcast on Substack called Versus Media, which is it's the same thing I had over on Patreon. I just I moved it to Substack this year, finally. And I was expecting a disaster. Just whatever you move an entire brand, an entire thing to platforms, and you're just expecting a ca catastrophe. And I was for about four months expecting it, and nothing. It went off without a hitch. It went perfect. Um, so I'm over there. So yeah, it's a subscription model, but you can sub for free if you want like just 15 minute preview podcast, whatever. Uh, I also write for Spectator. Yay. And uh, I also do a weekly piece or a weekly column for Washington Examiner. And you can also kind of occasionally find me New York Post and now Newsweek, which is fun. Do so. you, um, does your podcast go out to everybody or does it just live on Substack? It just lives on Substack, okay. except it, the preview goes through Apple. So you can probably search it on other platforms. Okay. Um, but um, yeah, I, I live pretty much just off the uh, bread and butter of my subscribers. I don't have sponsors or anything like that, which is great, you know, again, and kind of going back to what we talked about. And so it's subscription model. It's eight bucks a month. Okay. It's one, it's one extra Starbucks 
a week for an entire month of like four podcasts a week. I didn't do one yesterday because I had a ho- I had a concussion in hockey two nights oh, ago. Oh no! So yeah, um, a minor one. It wasn't a big one, but it was one of those where like I woke up yesterday and I was like seeing four of everything, and I'm like, that's not great. No. So, but well, um, you're pretty sharp yeah. for a guy who had a concussion. A day ago. Oh, I've, had, I've had I've had some of them. So I've had prior ones. So now I'm used to that. Okay. So it's like <laughs> I'm sitting here looking at my monitor and like you have like, you know, this weird purplish hue about you. And that's probably no, I'm joking. Uh, that's no, my it, was just, it was just a it was just a yeah, it was just a conk on the head. So um, that's the vaccine. So, <laughs> yeah, that too. I have as I'm getting older, I'm having these weird memory drops. I'm shutting the vaccine. So like, yeah, I was having these weird memory drops. Suddenly, I've noticed in like the last year, like I forgot the name of a hockey player who was when I lived in New York. I was an Islanders fan, and it was Jonathan Tavares, and he was like the greatest hockey player ever. And like a few months ago, this is the most obvious one. I couldn't remember his name. I was like, he's now playing for Toronto. What the fuck is this guy? I had to Google it. And that's the first time I went, is that the vaccine? <laughs> like, what is that? Because I am. I'm vaxxed. I, I'm vaxxed and I got one booster and I'm done. Mm. I did my civic duty. I'm not doing it again. Um, I caught COVID after the, I got vaccine and it hit me worse. And that's that was it. I'm like, done. Done with this. So whatever. I did my part. Thank you. I'm off of it. Um, but yeah, so uh, that was, that one was worrying to me, but nope. Um, I, I just, I, I had minor like conk on the head, whatever, two nights ago. And so, uh, I'm going to take a week and I'm going to just do it all over again, but I do a podcast from Tuesday through Friday. And, and where then, do we like find said, you on social? Oh God. I'm at red Steve's on Twitter. I used to, you know, I used to say I was at, at Sally Cohn and then she blocked me because <laughs> I think that got back to her. I don't know. I used to, whenever I appeared on a podcast or I did a I did a media hit, even on like Fox, they're like, "Where can we find you on social media?" I'm like, "I'm at Sally Cohn," and then she wouldn't block me, and I was like, "All right, I guess that joke's over with." Uh, so, but yeah, I'm at Red Steves on Twitter, still right. there. Well, this has been fun. Thank you for coming through, Bridget. Thank you. You're one in a million. <laughs> That's really not a compliment. People think it is. <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> It's time for the weekly check-in with Bridget and Cousin Maggie. Happy 4th of July, everyone. I hope you all made it through with all of your fingers. <laughs> Happy 4th of July. Indeed. I've actually never lived in a state where fireworks are legal. Really? Yeah. That's, I mean, maybe that's Utah, how blue but... blue you are. <laughs> I mean, that's I, a, that's I actually have no idea if, if fireworks were legal in Utah, but... Uh, it didn't. There weren't roadside stands selling them all over the place, as far as I can remember. I can Google it. They're Mormons. Yes, they are. Okay. Well, I never noticed, but here they're just selling them everywhere. <laughs> they hand them out <laughs> as party favors. Although I haven't been hearing them too much, but maybe. Oh, I've been hearing them the last two nights. Well, yeah, but not as much as like even our neighborhood in L.A. No, that's true. People would be selling, setting off shit for like the entire month of July. Yeah, that's what Jaron and I were talking about in our podcast is like how much East L.A. just goes off with yeah. The fireworks. Yeah, there was that drone footage, too, of 2020 during the pandemic when everyone was locked down and all of L.A. was lit up with fireworks. Yeah, I remember that. That was amazing. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's cool. It's nice to be here. It's it is. So we, a lot of parades. We're recording this. We haven't actually celebrated the 4th of July yet. So we'll be, we're a couple of days. But I hope everyone made it through. Uh huh. No, I liked your factory settings about the four, about America <laughs> and the 4th of July. <laughs> I do. I like the 4th of July. I don't think I love it as much as you do, but I like it. I love it. I'm a huge fan. Uh huh. It's just, uh, I always got to, in LA, there was there were always fireworks at uh, Santa Monica College, which is where yeah. if I sat on my roof, I could yeah. watch them. It was like I used the, to watch them, but it was like the weekend before. It was always the weekend before, yeah, uh, or like a week before. So you know, I got my fireworks fix, and then like one time, I think I went down to Marina Del Rey. Like in the first years I was living there, to my friend was having a party. She lived down there, I and I had no this. idea what I was getting into. I had no idea that it was like a huge thing, and that it was like apocalyptic traffic. Yeah. I've never seen anything like it. Usually, it takes me like it would take me ten minutes to go to her house. It took me over two hours to get home. I yeah. think it took me three hours to get home. It was 
crazy. I remember when you were doing that, I was like, okay. I had no idea. <laughs> Have fun. <laughs> and I was horrible. like, never doing that again. <laughs> Yeah, my friend Dusty and I did that one year and we ended up just driving around and then giving up. And then I went to Malibu a few years and that was just a shit show coming back from Malibu. It's just hours and hours of traffic on the way back. There was one time actually I remember early, early days I went up to the bluffs with a bunch of people and we watched like three different sets of fireworks yeah. along the beach. That was fun. Yep. There was um, a few good good times I had in Hollywood where you can see all the fireworks. If you're up in the hills, you can see pretty much every set of fireworks in Los Angeles. Yeah, because it's so flat down below. Yeah. yeah, and it's cool. You can see Marina Del Rey. You can see Malibu's multiple fireworks and Santa Monica. And that was always fun. Yeah. I always feel like as, as long as I get my fireworks fixed, it doesn't have to be on the 4th of July, but I like watching at least mm. one set of fireworks what if it, possible, but I'm not going to go like super out of my way to do it. <laughs> You're like Jaren. Jaren's like, I'm not making an effort to go see fireworks. <laughs> I mean, I'd, I'd go if it was like a crowd or like if I was going with people and we were going to go do a fun thing and there were fireworks, but I'm not just going to go like by myself in search of fireworks that I stand there and watch for 15 minutes. And then I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's fun though. It's a fun holiday. It is fun. It's so American. Yeah. It's very, well, <laughs> it's, obviously, it's, but it's very like, I, it's you know, birthday. you read those, uh, like, I, or I do, I read these, like, you know, things, the lists that people in, in other countries like are like, oh, does, does America, re does this really happen in America or is it only in movies? And one of them is like the 4th of July celebration. Oh, interesting. They're like, why do they call it the 4th of July? You know, it's July 4th. Why do they call it the 4th? Like, it's just a weird, mm. the way we celebrate it is a little strange to people, I guess. Well, I don't know. There was like all of these memes going around this past week where people were saying things like, oh, America, you think that you get to be a bitch on last week and that everybody's going to go to your birthday. And I'm assuming this was about all the like SCOTUS rulings. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, she does Whatever. assume that. <laughs> America does that every year. <laughs> she always does things we don't like, but you still love her. And still wants you to come to her birthday party. Uh huh. Yeah, it was funny. I thought that was a, uh, that was interesting little twist on it because it, I didn't have such an emotional reaction to the ruling. So it was just one of those moments where I was like, oh, people are really, really upset about this. Really mad at America. <laughs> <laughs> America. You know what I always think of this? You guys at the end, you were talking about they're like mad, what playlist. What's funny is they're mad that they didn't get free college and like, or their college bill erased. Is that one of them? Yeah, I think so. And You're asking the wrong person. <laughs> no more racism. <laughs> They're not be allowed to discriminate against Asians anymore. <laughs> America's pissed. <laughs> yeah. I always think of um, that song from the Gulf War when we were a kid. And I'm proud to be an American. Oh, yeah. That song always pops in was my head. Is that from the Gulf War? Yeah, it was like from when we all wore the yellow ribbons. I think I was in like fifth grade. Did you have to say the Pledge of Allegiance? Yes. I was thinking about this too. I went to this a Catholic something. school. So uh, I, I, I said the Pledge of Allegiance from kindergarten through sixth grade at this Catholic school. Then I went to another private school that was non-denominational. We I don't remember saying the Pledge of Allegiance there for seventh and eighth grade. So I never went to public school, though, so I don't know. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. Did they just drop it? Did they just drop it, like, after, after you were in eighth grade? Yeah. Everywhere? In high school, forget it. I, I don't think anyone's expecting high schoolers to stand up and be like, I pledge of allegiance. They should have. <laughs> that would have kept this, this generation in line. Uh-huh. <laughs> I don't know. I'd be Kept curious to know if it's line. something they do. It. The I was reading about this story about this Texas teacher recently who, you know, was teaching her kids like it was, 
it's okay. Like in America, we practice free speech. So you don't have to say the Pledge of Allegiance if you don't want to. So her class like decided not to in protest and she was like fired over it or something. So I think they still say it in Texas. Okay. That makes sense. I don't know about other places, really. Public school places. I don't know that they do it in California. They'd probably see it as like a fascist act. <laughs> I don't know. That's yeah, it's weird. Is is the Pledge of Allegiance dying? That it's would be an question. interesting. Well, it's weird, too, because I found out later that they inserted the words under God. That was not part of the original pledge. It was inserted in like the 80s, the 60s <laughs> or something or 50s or 60s. That makes sense. And, All you know, I can't freaking hippies. Yeah, it's weird. I was like, oh, it was that came in later. Like maybe they shoveled God it in can there. Save these heathens <laughs> once things started really going off the rails in yep. America. Yeah. The beginning of the end. After the kids started rebelling with pants and long hair, started doing <laughs> drugs and having sex. They were like, let's get God back in the schools. The real slippery slope was pants. <laughs> <laughs> Women wearing pants. <laughs> Bridget moved to Texas and went full trad wife. You should see the outfit she's wearing now. You should see the aprons people get me. Uh -huh. I should just start an apron collection. You totally should. Yeah, right. Like my husband would like one more thing of a like any things for clutter. you to collect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the only way I'd be able to start an apron collection is if I like burned it after every wearing. Uh, yeah. I do like living in a place that it's not a political statement to to like hang the American flag and mm -hmm. and to be like, I love my country. I wonder if it's a political statement if you don't. Are they like, you freaking commies? No, there's a ton of people around here who don't have one. Yeah. You know? Jaron and I went to the H-E-B on Sunday because we're idiots. And it was like, <laughs> <laughs> it was so busy. And the child is at this age where she just wants to like run everywhere. Uh -huh. And she was getting about to get mowed down. I was, she's uncontrollable. She's at that age where I need a leash. Uh huh. That was the first time I ever considered getting a child leash. Uh huh. I can't imagine having twins. No, no, neither can I. You can't, you would have to have leashes. leashes. They just go, yeah, your friend who has twins that age or three months older than her is like, they run in opposite directions. Yeah. And she's starting to run. She's just, it was insane. And I was like, oh yeah, we probably shouldn't have picked the Sunday before the 4th of July to come to the freaking H-E-B. I mean, that store is always busy. Always. I can't imagine what it was like that. It was insane. <laughs> We got there early too. Yeah, I bet. It was like we went to the farmers market and then stopped by and we go to the farmers market early, like when they open right. so that we can beat the heat and all the lines and everything. So it was probably nine AM uh -huh. and it was just people were waiting for the barbecue place to open. I mean, it was nuts. It was it I it was yeah, crazy. They're all having Sunday barbecue. Cupcakes, balloons. It's fun. I really like Texas. Texas is fun. Jaron was saying that twice now he's been to the grocery store and they're kind of allowed to openly recruit for the military and the, they oh. just will kind of talk to, you know, fathers and if they're with their young sons and wow. about service. Wow. Like you would never see that shit in California. No. It's different. Yeah. It's a whole different culture. It is like another country. Mm -hmm. We must go. I'm glad everyone made it through the fourth. Hopefully you all did. If you didn't, you're not listening to this mm. and you won't miss it. God anyways. bless. <laughs> <laughs> it is weird to think that people start this ho that, that holiday with 10 fingers and 10 toes and then not everybody makes it through. Yeah. Yeah. R.A.P. Uplifting thought to and end on finger. there. <laughs> Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life help you get out of your own way, and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank our composer, Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin, Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Fettesy. I'm Bridget Fettesy, and you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> it's the dumbest line. <laughs>